Uh, so we'll get into it. Nelson, kick us off. Hello, everybody. Nelson Freitas. I'm the Global, Global Chief Strategy Officer for OPMG, which is a division of uh, Om Omnicom. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Satilli. I am the Media Portfolio and Partnership Lead at Lilly. Good morning. I'm Steve Romney. I lead our consumer analytics organization for Eli Lilly and Company. Fantastic. Um, so we built a little bit of a track here to kind of build through not just the story of Lilly, but a story of marketers, right? So we're going to talk, obviously, about innovation. We are in the backdrop of CES and also a unique backdrop since it's our first CES in a couple of years. Uh, I think some of us are shaking off the dust of three days in Vegas. Uh, Storytelling, right? How do we talk about storytelling? How do we use innovation in tech to empower storytelling? And again, through a really unique lens. Um, and then the, uh, the experience ecosystem. Nelson and I were prepping a little bit and we started talking about media channels and rightfully so. Nelson sort of reframed it into experience, right? We are all here because we are brands and we want to talk to customers. And in some of those instances, that means rebuilding and refreshing a relationship with a current customer, but in many instances, it's how do we engage someone new? How do we start a brand new conversation? So we're going to sort of run that track here. So uh, we're going to go with the flow. So let's start with innovation. So uh, as sort of a primer, we're going to use innovation as a tell us about your job and how you use innovation. So uh, Steve, if you don't mind, why don't we work, work, work back to front. What does innovation mean to you in the vein of analytics? And give us also the COVID spin because it might have meant something different prior. Yep. So Innovation happens all the time in analytics, right? As we see platforms fracturing, we all get with the same question. How do we figure out how to get some information from our customers? How can we put it together in a way that can help our teams make better decisions that ultimately benefit our customers? And so the big piece we focus on as we get to innovation is where are the breadcrumbs we can find and how do we build that into a system that we can leverage over time to help our teams grow? Um, I think COVID was interesting for pharma because you, would, you wouldn't think that people would stop taking their medicine during a pandemic. If you look across pharma, it actually happened. You saw a diagnosis go down. You saw people have a harder time getting to a pharmacy. Like, think about that. It's a pandemic. You have to stay home. How do I go get my medication? And that's where you saw things like telehealth rise up dramatically. How do I talk to my doctors and find a way to deal with that? But also home delivery. How do I get to a different way to access my medications? And those things have continued with us in the market, and that's forcing change on how we have to think about your go-to-market model and what's your ecosystem need to contain. So no matter where you are, you can get the product that you need to be healthy. Yeah, and I would say in my role, um, we're all about experiences, to Nelson's point. So as we think about COVID, uh, a lot of how we were experienced content ch changed, and it's become even more fragmented, if that's even possible. So as we think about the work we do, it's all about grounding in the insights of our patients and how can we be people first. Um, one other thing too, I think it's, it's really important about kind of culturally how we try to think about innovation as well is that it doesn't always need to be that shiny penny, right? And I think that's a big thing when we have our teams and I try to speak to my team about that a lot because a lot of those small things that you were doing to drive innovation can actually in the end become much larger in, in scale. And it can be even evolving current capabilities we have because they've become outdated or test and learn, which we were talking about experiments earlier, which you think experiments are easy, but usually it's a, quite a level of due diligence. So as we look to optimize even that experience based on what we learned with that experimentation has been really key for us. Well then, so Nelson, you'll have the good bridge here, right? Because the bridge is how do you work through innovation in your role between client and agency, right? How do you team up to, to execute? Well, it, it's really interesting. I just want to pick up on um, Megan's point around it's pretty much everything. I think one of the things that COVID taught us is, you know, before we used to think about innovation, it used to be that thing that's behind the velvet rope and, you know, that particular group of people, and it's, it felt very VIP and very exclusive. Now I think we've realized, well, it's part of your everyday job. Uh, and if you don't make a part of your everyday job, then you're going to just naturally fa fall, fall behind. So in terms of in working with Lily, I think we try to bring as much as we can from the world of culture and the mu as much as we can from the world of consumers to be able to feed, feed that. And this is, like, so this is such a great platform for us, CES, because it, it kind of sets the bar really high. Uh, and then we start thinking about, well, how do we apply some of these things to not only our everyday things, you know, not necessarily the shiny penny, but bigger long-term long yeah. plays. Well, so let's use CS backdrop, but also I want to dive into that real quick. You know, 
Steve, you mentioned something outside and you just made a comment about we come to CES and we see innovation oftentimes has a corollary with speed, right? I work in the television business, right? Like I could stand up a new feature in three to four months if I needed to. You work in a regulated industry. So using CES as a backdrop for innovation, talk about innovation and speed and what that means. So I think one of the first pieces is we come back to it, speed's relative. Right, so everyone would say, well, oh my goodness, if I am on a CPG company and I have a shopping cart, right, I can do everything quickly and I'm going to see return really fast. It's slower in pharma, right? Our shopping cart's not quite that connected. But we also see, as you look at the things that are happening on your tech ecosystems, on the way that we are using a lot of automation capabilities, how do I get marketers' information faster on the things our customers are doing so that we can trigger those actions to get them to the right content at the right place at the right time? and create that connected story. Yeah. Oh, good. yeah, I would also add, and this is kudos to Steve, um, I feel like we have been on very much on a journey to get to a place where we're operating in an agile environment and we can get to those insights quicker and we can make those decisions quicker for patients. To Steve's point, we're never gonna be a retailer, but I think we've made a lot of huge headway. Sure. Yeah, um, forgive me, I know there's a little bit of background noise there. I think we're trying to deal, it sounds like someone's voicemail, did it go? Got I think it. it went. There you go. Yeah. Got it. Um, so, okay. So then, so then let's use CES, right? So talk about CES and coming here with, with either a specific learning agenda or something you're looking to inspire you, right? Because I know I show up here. What's that inspiration point? What's that thing that says, ah, that's something? How do you approach an event like CES with a specific learning agenda? Uh, I can speak to this. And Nelson, I'll have you jump in. So for three years now, we've used CES as a jumping off point to honestly guide the conversations for the year. We look at the top trends in and out of healthcare because I think that's important because our consumers are just not in healthcare. Like how are they, um, what are their needs outside of healthcare? What are the experiences they went there? Um, the element of, you know, example, frictionless. I mean, that needs to be parallel to, to what we do here. So we use that as a jumping off point and we often bring that in to say, okay, what's the so what for Lily? And we start to think, okay, what do we need to evolve going into the remainder of the year into next year to even build business cases around that? I know Nelson's um, been a part of this for about three years. And it's, you know, it, it's so interesting because I remember having this conversation with not only Lee, but other clients. It's like sometimes CS can have the, the perception of, oh, you know, it's just a big boondog and we're just all going to hang out and drink and have shooters and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, well, no, actually, it's like such a great jump start to your year and thinking because for me, it's to, to make this point, it sets a high bar, you know, like, oh, wow, I'm, we have to think bigger. Yeah. We have to think bigger, especially in the space of healthcare and digital. I mean, if, if you haven't gone to the convention center, you should. And if you're in this space, it's like everything is proactive, life care, connected, database. So it becomes a great way for, to make this point for us to start not only thinking about our everyday, but how do we infuse it um, across yeah. our, our, all of our work that we do with Lily, not only short term, but a kind of long-term yeah. long, long -term plays. I think, I think the other piece that, you know, as we come here, it, it helps us stay grounded on what's coming for consumers. Sure. Um, because when, you know, when we all look at our healthcare, we're not, we're not looking around saying, I expect the experience I have in healthcare to be different than the experience I have with all the other products yeah. in my lives. Yeah, sure. So as we talk about themes around personalization, around how are we bringing that experience that a consumer wants to have yeah. um, in a time that makes sense to them, yeah. Um, that's, we come here looking to see what are those trends, what are those ideas that are going to change, yeah. and how can we transform what we're doing to make sure their experience feels like that when they work with us. Sure. No, I love that. Well, I think it also threads, I mean, it's a really nice thread into, okay, storytelling and then the experience ecosystem, but also, I mean, what's our biggest challenge as marketers is fragmented attention, right? Yeah. And CES is the ultimate, like, oh, look at the, oh, look at the kitty, oh, look, you're right, you're just, you can't keep your eyes focused, right? And you're like, got it, we as real people, need to remember how much brand exposure we get in a singular day and not even just brand exposure but experience exposure and so at the same time we're trying to figure out right like the hippocampus and memory and getting a brand message like there's so much to navigate here right so so why don't we make it maybe take us then into storytelling right because the world of medicine is to the point so differentiated than retail or uh, consumer electronics or auto, right? So how do you take sort of all this innovation and apply that to storytelling? Yeah, I can speak to some of the work that I'm closest to. So um, 
About two years ago, Lilly made the conscious decision to actually launch its first master brand campaign to consumers. We've talked to stakeholders, but not actually to our patients more broadly as Lilly. Um, you know, but we were coming from a place no one even knows who Lilly is, right? Um, we've been creating medicines for over 140 years, but no one even knew the product they were taking was actually a Lilly product. Um, so as we kind of set out on this journey, um, we made a conscious decision to kind of look within ourselves. And uh, we actually spoke to, I want to say, like 50 plus employees across the whole organization, manufacturing, medical. We wanted to get a sense of like, what does Lily mean to them? What, what, you know, why do they come to work? What's that motivation? I mean, among other kind of market research, but I felt like that really fueled what we we wanted to say. So from the art of storytelling, the, the campaign POV came very much about the fact of, everybody um, should have a chance to reach their potential. It was very much in the, the backdrop of what was happening at the time, which was obviously the world had stopped, health had stopped that um, from reaching our potential because of, of COVID. So it was a very kind of timely uh, uh, you know, conversation to have. I mean, we talked about you know, culture health became part of culture at that time. And I think it's continued to you know, be positioned differently than it ever has before. Um, so through that work, we, we leveraged the Olympics as kind of a platform to tell that story, which um, is very much had also had some trials and tribulations. It was postponed for the first time because of health and it, its existence. Um, so there was very much a parallel between Lily, our patients, the Olympics and health and the importance of health that surrounded there. And then when it came to the story um, telling element, I'll add one more thing. What was really great is we could bring that to life, not just through demonstrating what we believe more broadly and driving that awareness about our belief, but we told authentic stories with Olympic athletes and Paralympic athletes talking about their health journey or how, how, what was that journey to reach their potential? How had their mother who had supported them, who had metastatic breast cancer along that journey? So it made it much more personal versus we weren't just talking to um, you know, our patients and consumers. We were actually bringing them into the conversation. You could see the dialogue actually happening in real time, which was great. Let me ask, was that a pivot of some kind? So you made a comment, and, and Steve, you kind of alluded to this, like 100 plus years of history, and no one knew that they were taking medications that came from Lilly. Yeah. Cut to the Olympics, Eli Lilly front and center. Like it was, it was a brand moment. Prior to that, did it matter if patients didn't know who Eli Lilly was, but they knew the drug, right? Like is the relationship with the therapeutic itself, but not the brand? Did that matter? Was there a distinction? I'm curious. I think one of the things for us when you started saying, oh, I'm taking Moderna, I'm taking Pfizer, the vaccine, uh, and I would say COVID in general, conversations started to change, right? Of how people talked about medicine and uh, the reputation of that organization mattered to you. So I, I think that among, as we said, many things that were happening culturally at the moment from a health perspective, I think that changed how we wanted to position ourselves and start to enter in that conversation and also demonstrate some of the work that we're doing that ladders up to those beliefs. Totally. I think there's one piece I'd also add. I think part of it is tied into consumer attention, yeah. right? So if you start back in history, I think it's true for a lot of pharma companies where a lot of, a lot of comp people would know us to say, oh, this is, this is Prozac. This is the company that made Prozac. And that was through the lens of the brand, yeah. Yeah. right? And, and as attention shifted during the pandemic, it became more about um, the companies and, and how are they helping to support yeah. all of us, right? Yeah. And do so during the pandemic. And that's where you saw the corporate equity start to change. Sure. And the way we hold and gain interest, we had to evolve part of how we're speaking to our customers. Yeah. Brands are always going to be important. Yeah, sure. But there's now a new piece we want to add into yeah. that. Well, then, then Steve, maybe dive in with, with the data lens, right? So, and we started talking about this outside a little bit, right? About um, is there data that can showcase an emotional connection? It, to the point, all of a sudden, Moderna, Pfizer, like we're on a first name basis with these massive pharmaceutical companies, whereas prior, it didn't really matter. I was prescribed something or I took something OTC. Where does data and speed and optimizing for storytelling come in? Like, where's the jump from a piece of data to an insight that says we're going to do something different. Yeah, and I, so I think this is like for all of us as the ecosystem fractures, it's becoming how do you get the pieces that you can see and how do you apply multiple disciplines, right? So not only we use words like attribution, right? All of us, you hear that, we're saying how much of the journey can I see and how can I translate that into something I can pick a moment where I know how to touch a customer and how to bring a story on that fits at the right time. 
I don't have the whole picture. So I also have to apply things like behavioral economics. I have to bring in market research and understand the why. I may not know the what very clearly, but if I understand the why, I can start to bring all those pieces together and do so in systems that start to speed up. How can I get that information to our teams so that they can start to evolve quickly? And that's, that's where, as we talk about CES, we get into automation. We get into how is tech evolving to make it easier for us to get that information to more of our teams in their workflow. Right? Think about ops and how do we do so in a way so that they can just work on ev evolution versus always trying to interpret data themselves. And that's been part of our key focus. Would you say the role of an analytics organization changed drastically? I mean, to, to your point, you're oftentimes the one charged with like what's next, right? Yep. We've talked about attribution for the entirety of advertising. <laughs> We're constantly trying to rearrange what that actually means. Today we talk a lot about advanced currency. Currency and measurement are not the same thing. They're somewhat nested into each other. They're not the same thing. So do you feel a different responsibility or impetus to be on the bleeding edge so Megan can go out and activate agency partners can create quickly and pivot? Like, is that responsibility different? I think it is, right? Because yeah. if you look at the external environment, because the environment's changing so fast, we have to change with it, right? And that's in order to provide those insights that help you in saying not only how do you help your customers, but ultimately we're all held to a PL, right? So it's, it's how do you make those changes quickly and help our partners and our companies understand the changes we need to make are gonna cost some dollars. How do we make sure that they see the value in that? And that, that flex is transforming. That's part of the reason why we're change agents is because we have to help push our ecosystems in places that a lot of our teams are coming up to speed at a different rate than we are, right? And so how do we do that and help them see that, but do that through the lens of our customers so that yeah. that connection happens? Yeah and the decision makes sense. Um, I think uh, just to, to build a little bit on what Steve said, I think, and, and Megan around reaching your potential, I think the storytelling in the category of pharma has, has been traditionally like a, a, a little laggard and, and kudos to these guys for coming up with such a provocative um, reach your potential. Because when you, when you look at the insights and behavioral economics, it's like we're looking at our healthcare in a very different way. You know, we're much more open about it. Uh, it's about life care, not sick care. It's about our quality of life. I mean, you just go to everything that we've seen here. It's all about being, you know, not reactive but proactive, and you know, living a better life. And that's what fundamentally at the core what what we're trying to do with yeah. with Lily in terms of helping people reach their their potential, which is why the Olympics piece and all that just kind of made complete yeah. complete sense. And putting Lily at the forefront of that conversation versus at the you know, not at the forefront of that conversation. Really? Well, I think, it, candidly, I think also, you know, the Olympics were what felt like a dusting yeah. of normalcy. Yeah. And, you know, normalcy now has sort of air quotes that travels with it, right? Because we don't know what that is now. Um, and that's probably a good thing, right? That it's not always this, you know, we're breaking from the status quo. But either way, it, life care and not sick care. I yeah. actually, they, like, that's not a storyline or a tagline already that's well, being we, in use. We've talked about that. Right? So like, let's just, sorry. <laughs> no one else write that down. This is yeah, theirs. This is down. theirs. Um, well, I do think that's so important because also I think, you, and this again is a perfect segue into sort of the experience ecosystem. We spent a lot of time in and around uh, media conversations talking about fragmentation, right? And, you know, in the last couple of years, in the last decade or so, you know, that's meant social, that's meant influencers, that's meant sort of different ways to now speak to customers. Again, it, it's hard to, nest a big pharma in some, like, you're probably not working with influencers, right? Like, that's just not really maybe, oh, good. Uh, <laughs> but like when we talk about experience ecosystem, right? Perfect, right? So let's thread into that, right? So then it, there are so many ways to talk to a customer and build a relationship. So like, how has that changed? How are you evaluating? Is there something influencer -y coming, right? Like, how has your evaluation of touch points changed over these last couple of years? Whoever wants to. I would say to, um internally we've had to react to that to how we're structured so it's really interesting so within the team i sit in uh they manage uh, consumer and hcp media because we got to have the connection mm -hmm. to our healthcare professionals um and i think we got a lot more work to do there to be honest um but we'll get there um we have a, a team that's thinking through personalization how are we driving those unique experiences um with our patients um we have a partnership team that's thinking through relationships with third parties, so talent, as you're talking influencers or platforms, and a multicultural team who's, who's thinking through how are we coming through and being culturally relevant with our patients. So obviously we are on 
part of this larger team, but to a, a consumer, they're getting messages from all of it. So that they're all of us, technically, that are working on this. So there's a, an element of orchestration we're doing. I think we could do be doing more, um, but I think that's something that we're really conscious of right now. Is that we want to meet them where they're at on their journey, um, and we want to make sure it, it, you know that each of these silos are doing it at the appropriate time, but it doesn't feel like it's siloed. Sure. Uh, to to our patients. I think the other part on, on our teams, um, part of it is kicking the tires on your assumptions. Um, one of the things that we've seen across our measurement ecosystem is that um, the ways we have been operating actually needed to adjust, right? And, and a lot of us are starting to get into those journeys on how do I transform from a linear marketing mix model to explainable AI? How do I start to, because when we started to do some testing, we realized a lot of the assumptions that we have that were built sometimes many years ago um, don't hold anymore. Um, and so I now have to get more data driven and less assumptive. And that requires kind of two things, right? You have to upgrade your approach. What are the tools that I'm using and how am I getting there? But the second one, this one where it gets hard, right? For all of us. Um, how many people have heard the word experiment here a gazillion times, right? Like almost everybody. Um, and experiments make sense. We all know how to design them. They're very hard to execute, right? When you talk about what's the things you have to do to get metadata right, how do you do so in a way that you can learn, in a way that's gonna help you reinforce that decision you wanna make with your customer and ultimately tell a better story? Yeah. Um, for us, that started out with, let's check our assumptions first. Yeah. And we've changed several of our approaches to evolve because we realized we were outdated, we need to adjust. Well, isn't marketer intuition, right? The relationship between data and intuition. It's the comment you just made, the, Vizio, we very much sit at that, like bring your linear dollars into streaming. Like we're one of the change agents in that space. And the amount of brands we sit down with who say, this is the hard part. I have an MMM tool that still tells me to buy cheap daytime cable. Yep. And absolutely nothing about that resonates rationally. So how do you balance, maybe from an agency perspective as a guide and a consult, what data might tell you versus marketer intuition and how you work together on a recommendation? Yeah, um, I, I think me just as a strategist, I always yeah. come at it from the humanity of it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> to make this point, it's like, where are people? How are they using these things? What's the experience? What's the insight? And then let yeah. the execution follow versus, well, that's a you know kind of cool channel. Let's just go over there. But is that appropriate for our message, for our audience, for, mm -hmm. for everything that we want to, for we want to do? So it's like the insight and the idea and the experience guides it over the actual sure. ch uh, channel. Yeah. I would say too, um, and Steve, you'll, you can speak more to this, but to your point, I, I think when we see uh, maybe we might consider something's not performing well, right? We are going to look into that deeper. We're not just going to make a call off of one analysis, and that's what we've tried, tried to do. And, and we're not going to make a call as something's not successful for one product because it's not all created equal. So I think we've been conscious about creating those learning agendas and trying to be um, not make bold statements right out of the gate based on what we're seeing. I do love, I mean, look, sort of double clicking into the word experiment, right? Too often times in the media ecosystem, it's easy to say this worked, it didn't work, move on. When, as you know, coming from big pharma, right? Like we're testing, we're experimenting and everything is a phase. I actually think as an industry, we need to just dump the word test altogether and start and just focus on phases. Because in phase one, you learn something. And that will now inform what you do next. Versus the word test, which oftentimes comes with this very clear and hard line that says it did or it didn't and now let's move on. I, I think there's a distinction in there that needs to be be very clear. Um, Steve, just because you brought up, right, like the building net new tools around traditional MMM and linear, right? Uh, let's talk about streaming. Let's talk about future of TV, right? Because that still is a backdrop for a huge percentage of television. Uh, when we talk about sponsorship opportunities and content, the Olympics, right? Like that's largely a television event. So. Is there an evaluation and or how do you evaluate kind of linear and streaming and what new TV looks like? Yeah, so I think like all of us, it's, it's for us, it's a function of what data can you get, yeah. right? And whether that is something that can go into a mixed model or in some cases it can't, right? It's sometimes you're working with descriptive analytics that are good enough. And so we, we're constantly trying to bring those two pieces together. Where can we design in small experiments so we can learn as we go? Streaming is a good example. We've had many of those that we've done. Um, and what we're ultimately trying to do, if you go back to the customer, right, we've tested multiple different campaigns where we're trying to take a look and say, if I've got new creative, it's targeted at this group, streaming is actually a great way to test it. How can I learn? And how can I feed that into an MMM? And can that help me shape the way we want to go to approach and buy? 
and when you get to upfront, you get to the market. I think that's part of what we've been trying to do and make sure we have toolkits that can enable that. Yeah. Um, and also for, as we're evolving, um, we're being tasked to say, how do you do it with smaller resourcing? Whether that's people, whether that's money, how do you do so in a way that you can automate those structures and have a way to make that scalable yeah. across your ecosystem? Yeah. So that our partners, and many of them are in, and in the audience today, um, some of them have helped us build our ecosystem and some of us some of them use the actual insights we create. Yeah. Um, can do the best job they can for us in the market. Sure. Megan, you feel there is, there, is there any other tweak on sort of the way streaming plays a role versus traditional, or, or is it similar kind of down Steve's path is like, we're, we're gonna evaluate case by case? You know, I, I think that we've definitely started to make a shift, right? Just more broadly, I'll say at a portfolio level, um, and we'll probably continue to do so, because we're gonna go obviously where our, wherever our patients exist. But to Steve's point, I think whenever we make any type of investments into new channels, we're very conscious about the measurement, having a strong measurement plan and trying to understand performance with that. Yeah. Um, so we're getting, we're, we're nearing time. Uh, prepare questions in the end. We're gonna throw a couple more out here to the group, uh, but then we'll come to the crowd for questions in two, three minutes or so. So start getting them ready. Um, so just talking a little bit about uh, in kind of wrapping and in thinking about 2023, it's, it's CES again, we're here, we're looking. What are the big priorities for you for this year? Uh, either culturally within your team, and I have a follow-up question on team and talent, uh, but what's most important for your team? What's most important for your personal learning agenda? Like for you, what is 2023 about? I, I think I'm gonna volunteer, okay. Um, I think that the piece we're looking into the most right now is attention. Right, so when you think about all of us right now, CS is a good example. We are so fractured; it is so hard to see what's everything that's happening. Um, one of the things is we're you know we're kicking our assumptions to say how how much do we see our customers, all of us. When you think about how do I actually consume media today, mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the newer emerging capabilities around attention, that's where we're kind of crafting into. How do you tie that into the way we do creative and storytelling, yeah. and do so in a way that we can start to augment that approach? Um, because I think there, there's some things we probably have to get better at. Sure. I would say, so um, the Olympics, I'm using that as a point of reference of sure. what I'm getting to, but we were the first regulated company to ever work with Team USA, which is, was a big learning curve for them when it came to approval of content, to say the least. Um, but I don't think anyone else had done it because they didn't think it could be done, yeah. if that made sense. Because we, we do have a, a lot of requirements when it comes to our content. So I think this year there'll, there'll be a focus, and I'll say this kind of broadly not to give too much away of trying to, trying to think of what are those other moments? We're in culture, can, can we enter into the conversation? Can we do that through partnerships? Yeah. I think it's something that we're thinking about yeah. um, and, and, and investigating, but will, will likely be a priority for us. Uh, my mine is and that's a similar from what Megan and Steve said. I mean, I was just going through my head about you know all the challenges you know we as marketers or innovators face. It's like more fragmented channels, more demands on brands and expectations on brands. You got to do more. You got to you know do all these different things. Uh, cookieless world. It's like it's gonna be harder to, to actually reach people and you know get get people. It's like how do you play now in a world where it's so easy to be ignored, not noticed? cut through, it's like, to your point, we've got so much stimulus coming at us. How do you cut through and not only just cut through, but set the standard in, yeah. in cutting through. Um, and I, I just love working with Lily in this space because it's kind of really, really personal to all of us, our healthcare and where it's going and we're much more proactive about it. So for us, for me, that's kind of like the thing. How do we set the standard versus, you know, yeah. you know try pre pretend we're putting something out there, but it's not really cutting through because there's so much noise anyway. Sure. Yeah. I think maybe there's more piece too, maybe to add on to Nelson's comments. One of the things that's kind of key for us, and it's I think for almost everybody in the room, um, with all the changes that are happening, I'm gonna actually jump into privacy for a second. Mm. Right? One of, the, one of the aspects we all are thinking about and saying, how do we get better on storytelling where we would connect with our customers is first party data, mm -hmm. right? And so when you think about that value transfer and how you help our customers say, I trust Lily enough that I want to share my information with them in a way that helps us help them yeah. as well as others. Yeah. Um, that's a big key as we continue to evolve. Um, it, it's hard to do in pharma, yeah. um, and that's that's tied in. Obviously, lots of implications on the data side, yeah. um, on the work we do, but it starts off with the, the front end of how do you convince people to be willing to share? Well, it's, it's a conversation around consumer trust and also treating consumers with 
the respect that we want to bring them into the conversation, right? Advertising, just the broad spectrum of it, has been folded into popular culture from the sands of time, right? Soap operas was, and now used Tide, right? In the middle of a show, like it was built into the, 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 the ethos of content creation, right? We're now at this really important point where you're saying, no, no, I'm, there's, a, there's a value exchange. I'm asking you for your data in order to deliver you something better. We have to be really honest with ourselves about what is consumer value. And because the streaming world, the layperson is saying, well, hang on, what's this whole ad experience? And why am I getting brought to you by and presented by It's like, it, it's built into this ecosystem. It's just now kind of in your face. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I think it's a really, it, it's okay. We have to tell ourselves like advertising is okay when it's done uh, truthfully and honestly and sort of with consumer value in mind. Yep. So um, why don't we, we'll end with one and then we'll go to the group. So, and this is an important one and we're gonna maybe skip our silly one about shows you haven't watched, but we'll see. Um, talent, right? In the last couple of years, I think we've put talent and uh, the way we train teams and the way we hire and then think about people in a very different light. So uh, when we think about how we use our most valuable resource, which is each other, um, what would you go tell your younger self? If you were entering the, the, the industry now, the ad marketplace, the media ecosystem, what guidance would you give to your younger self today, knowing what you know? So I started on, on the agency side, and I, at that time, thought, oh, I want to work on this client. I want to work on this initiative, this work stream, this great campaign. Um, and like looking back and where I'm at now, I'm like, I actually just want to work for passionate, authentic leaders. And I want to find mentors and allies and, and sponsors that are, are going to help me as I kind of navigate my career. I think it, it, to me it's become much more people focused. We spend so much time at work <laughs> and, and to actually enjoy who you work for and be motivated and insp inspired by them. I would actually say, uh, you know, follow kind of those types of leaders in your life or at least look for them for inspiration and or um, advice throughout your career. Uh, for me, I would say um, I, got, I got to Lily um, by accident almost. Um, and I wasn't at the place where I was like, oh my gosh, I need to grow up and work in, in healthcare. Um, and I think one of the things I would go back and tell myself is um, being passionate about the reason why you work. You know, we're, we're fortunate enough, we get a chance that the work we do every day, if we do our jobs well, people live longer. Um, that makes it really easy to commit a lot of hours. It makes it really easy to work harder um, because at the end of the day, literally in our jobs, people live longer if we do it well. Um, I had to learn that. I would, in my 20s, I would not have been able to articulate that at all. Um, but being passionate about the work you do um, and the impact it has on your customers. Um, I started out like I just need a job to get paid, right? And, and I think that's where I would go back and try to make sure that vision's there. Yeah. Wasn't that clear? Um, uh, actually, I think this is so strange. I think mine is kind of in the same vein. I, I think as a strategist, I've always been incredibly curious about the, the world, but I think do even more of that. Open yourself up to pretty much everybody and everything. Um, and perhaps read less marketing and business books, because I feel like sometimes that leads you down a path that, I don't know, doesn't feel human or, or, or sincere. Like really go out and understand the world and people and what makes people tick, because that yeah. ultimately is what we do. We, we want to engage people. We want people to be excited about what we do. Yeah. Uh, and I think when you're passionate about the world and you're passionate about people, yeah. it makes it so much easier to do, to do that. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree totally. Uh, I'll throw my own in just for, for the sake of it. I think it's, uh, it's okay not to know. We, we work in an industry where everybody, we, we love to head nod and be like, oh yeah, sure. Like we love to pretend we know the answer. It's okay not to know. In fact, it's way more interesting when you don't know and you get to ask questions and find out something new. So throw that one in there. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting the hook. Uh, I got the sign. We'll, I'll, just cause I have the mic. One question, anything from the crew? We got time? Okay, Paul. All right, maybe time for a question. Yeah. Front. Ye yell and project, so and, 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 and who are you? Uh, as you're talking about it, you're talking about meeting the moment, right, with David's key. And you're talking about kind of how your sponsorships and partnerships form that brand. I'd love if you can take a minute to talk about how your programming and, and um, social endeavors can form that brand. In, in particular, I was looking up the, um, the Reimagining Mental Health uh, Eli Lilly program and thinking about how topical that was to the last couple of years and how you can emerge as a leader and form that connection um, in, in, a, in a free environment where they're pulling your content in because of programming, not necessarily because of, like programming is part of your brand, right? And so can you just talk about how, how that reflects on your kind of 
Mexico gets it. I'm not familiar with that program. Are oh. you, Steve? Yeah, so I was going to say this is this is not what I'm going to be I able to answer been easily. There so, as well. um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to we're going to have to pause on that one because I can't get you that one well enough to answer it. But, but I mean, just, I guess mental health in general is a big challenge yes. for you guys. Correct. So you talk about how that reflects on the brand. That would be just as good. You're right. I would say yeah, that's fair. Historically, right, that's been a, a big area of focus um, as far as our pipeline looking forward. You know, at least what I am privy to. I don't know if that that is moving forward. But I would say what was really funny is I can actually pull it. Uh, comment on a moment that happened during the Olympics, which was when Simone Biles was very upfront um, about her mental health. And I know, you know, there was discussion very quickly of, well, yes, I mean, we're, we're a life care company. I mean, it's what well, those words weren't said, but yeah. right, we, we need to have a position in the marketplace. So we very much came out and said something, you know, socially, um, as well as and put some spin to promote some that belief out there. But I think it's, this kind of all goes back to understanding our patients more, not just seeing them as someone who's taking our medicine or a prescription, but looking them, at, looking at them as much more than that, because that's what they are. And I think when we're able to do that, and that at least comes across, then we come much more authentic to them. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Steve, Megan, Nelson, thank you so much. Brand Innovators, thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right, please join me in thanking Adam, Nelson, Megan, and Steve. Steve, by the way, I got into Lily by accident.